I've come back to the chalkboard to talk some more about human genetic variation. Again, we're going to look at DNA sequences between people in the world today. In this case, what we want to do is uncover something about the history of human populations from their present day pattern of variation. Now today's genetic variation is a product of multiple forces in the past. There have been forces that are demographic forces, such as population growth, very small population size, and the structure of ancient populations. That is, how are they apportioned across space with limited migration among them? Another thing that affects today's genetic variation is the history of natural selection in past populations. Some of the genes in our genome today are very limited in variation because natural selection has weeded out all of the different variants that might have changed their function in ancient people. Some parts of the genome today are really variable in the world because there are multiple different alleles today that have beneficial effects in different populations. So when we look across the genome at today's pattern of human variation, we have to think about the pattern of demog demographic changes in the past. We also have to think about the pattern of natural selection in the past. Now, what I most want to emphasize in this lecture is the way that we're learning about African genetic variation today and the importance of African populations in their contribution to the variation around the world today in human populations. It's, generally speaking, about the origin of modern humans. But as you'll see, our genetic evidence about this has become more complex over the last several years. And so what once seemed to be a simple story to people has become a complicated story. This lecture is going to talk about the out of Africa hypothesis for modern human origins. It's going to talk about the alternative hypothesis, the multi-regional hypothesis. Both of those were very common hypotheses in the 1980s, 1990s. And finally, we'll talk about why today we understand that there's a synthesis of different events that led to today's pattern of genetic variation and how we're learning so much about our complicated human population and its history. So what is genetic variation in a population? When we talk about genetic variation, what we mean is that we're going to compare DNA sequences from two different people or from many different people, and we're going to make an estimate of how different people are on average from each other. That kind of estimate is a simple measure of genetic variation. A genetic variation today is apportioned across human populations in different ways. So it really matters who we're looking at to the conclusion of how we interpret that variation in past populations. Let's begin with a very simple example. For most of your genome, if you're a woman, for all of your genome, including the X chromosomes, you carry two of them, and for a man, all of your genome except the X and Y chromosomes, you carry two copies of most DNA sequences. If you compare those two copies that you have to each other, for many parts of your genome, those two copies will be identical to each other. They're the same. For some parts of your genome, those two copies will be different from each other. How is it that these differences come to be? Well, if we consider your ancestry, looking back into your genealogical history, we can get a really simple accounting of your genealogy by considering your mother and your father. Each of them has a mother and a father. Each of them has a biological mother and father, so that in the first generation leading back to you, you have two ancestors. In the second generation, you have four. In the third generation, eight. The fourth generation, 16. This doubles every generation going back into the past. In other words, your genealogy becomes massively more complicated in every generation. You have double the number of ancestors. It doesn't take very many ancestors for that genealogy to begin to add up to a lot of possible lines of descent. I mean, consider, in 10 generations, you have 1,024 ancestors. In 20 generations, you have more than a million. In 30 generations, 
a billion, that's a thousand millions. Forty generations is a million millions. That's a trillion possible lines of ancestry. Forty generations of time is only about a thousand years. And so we're looking at millions of millions of possible lines of ancestry just in your genealogy within the last thousand years. Obviously, all of those lines of genealogy do not go back to separate people. There weren't a trillion people in the world a thousand years ago. Those lines of genealogy have to go back to a much smaller number of people. In fact, what happens is that your mother and your father, at some point in their genealogy, are relatives of each other. Tracing back your father's great, 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 great grandfather and your mother's great, 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 great grandfather, those two may be the same individual. That grandfather had descendants. Those descendants each had lines of descent and progressing back, progressing and progressing forward into the present day, what we'll discover is that your lines of genealogy converge into the past to a relatively small number of ancestors. This process in genetics is called inbreeding. And inbreeding is hugely important because what it means is that the genetic ancestry of a person in the world today represents only a subset of their genealogical ancestry. In every generation, your genome breaks itself up into smaller parts. A chromosome breaks apart and recombines so that there's a shuffling of DNA upon the chromosomes. But the number of those crossing over events is relatively limited. So that in every generation, you're inheriting substantially large chunks of DNA from your father and your mother in an intact form. And some of those chunks came from your paternal grandfather, and some came from your paternal grandmother, and some came from your maternal grandmother and your maternal grandfather. So those chunks break apart as we look further back into the past, but, but nevertheless remain relatively long. Sometimes millions of base pairs, up to tens or hundreds of thousands of base pairs within the past few thousand years of reproduction. What that means is that if we look back into the relatively recent past, only eight or ten generations ago, you have genealogical ancestors, ancestors that had descendants that led to you from whom you have inherited no DNA. That is a random process, whether or not the DNA is transmitted into a chromosome, into an offspring or not. And that random process means that your genetic ancestry is a subset of your genealogical ancestors. As we go far enough back in the past, what we'll discover is that there's a point at which everybody in the world that lived at that time can be divided into two groups. Your ancestors, people that are real genealogical ancestors of you, and your non-ancestors, people that aren't your ancestors. And far enough back into the past, tens of thousands of years ago, the people that are ancestors of you are also ancestors of everyone else living now. And the people that aren't ancestors of you are ancestors of nobody living now. They have no living descendants. You see, looking back into the past, our present-day genetic heritage comes from only a subset of the people that were alive at different points in the past. Sometimes that subset is not random because some populations became extinct. But in many cases, the subset is not random because some populations were larger than others or because some populations had a greater expansion over space than others. There are some really important ancestors of living people in the past. And in historic times, we notice them. People like Charlemagne, who has many, many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of living descendants, even though he only lived around 1,200 years ago. That's because some families have grown over time 
and other families have shrunk over time. That shrinking and growing of different family groups has left its mark on our present day genetic variability. Now when we look at recent ancestors, it's sometimes the case that we can estimate the time that those ancestors lived. And if we compare two copies of a gene in someone's genome or, or between two different people, we can estimate the time period in which the common ancestor of those two copies lived. Let's consider if we have two copies of a gene, each of them has a parent, each of those parents inherited that copy of the gene from one of their parents. Each of them inherited it from one of their parents, and so on further and further and further back. This is somewhat different than looking at your personal genealogy, because when we consider your personal genealogy, you have two ancestors in every generation, but each copy of one of your genes comes from one copy in the previous generation. The only thing that can happen to these genealogical lines as we look further and further and further back in the past is that at some point they come from one person in the previous generation. That is what we call the coalescent of these two copies of the gene in a present day population. The coalescent time depends on a lot of things, but the single biggest influence on the coalescent time is the amount of inbreeding that there is in the present day population. How likely is it that your mother and father were relatives of each other? If your mother and father were cousins of each other, there's a pretty good chance that two copies of, your, of a single gene in you have come from a single copy that existed only three or four generations ago. But if your parents come from very different regions of the world, it's very unlikely that your two copies will coalesce within a few generations. It's probably going to be many dozens or hundreds of generations before your two copies will coalesce. For many human genes, the coalescent time is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And so when we look across the human genome, we'll discover that some of your genes share common ancestors, your two copies share common ancestors that lived a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago. But many others only share common ancestors a hundred thousand years ago, 500,000 years ago. There's a few parts of the human genome where a given person's two copies might share ancestors that lived in ancient primates that were common ancestors of humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. We have variation that literally goes back before the origin of the hominins. But most of our genes have common ancestors that lived within the Pleistocene, within the last two million years. And the biggest part of our genome has common ancestors that lived in the middle Pleistocene, between around 125,000 and around 780,000 years ago. Now, many people who are interested in human evolution have heard of the out of Africa theory and the importance of mitochondrial DNA to determining our common ancestry as modern humans. Let me explain a little bit about how the out of Africa theory came about and how we today look at it not only from the standpoint of mitochondrial DNA, but from the rest of the genome. If you've been interested in human evolution, you might very well have heard of the out of Africa theory of modern human origins and the importance of mitochondrial DNA to establishing the common African origin of living people throughout the world today. Let me explain a little bit about how that hypothesis came about and how we today look at it from the standpoint of the rest of the genome beyond the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is a short segment of DNA that's found outside of the nucleus of your cells. It's found inside of an organelle called the mitochondrion. Mitochondrial DNA is not inherited in the same way as your chromosomes. It's only inherited from your mother. And it's very short compared to the DNA that's in the rest of your genome. 
The mitochondrial DNA is only 16,000 base pairs. Your genome as a whole is 3 billion base pairs, and you have two copies of most of it. So the mitochondrial DNA is very limited in the amount of information it gives us. It represents only one line of your genealogy, where in the recent past you have many, many, many trillions of possible lines of genealogy. So the mitochondrial DNA is limited. But because it's inherited intact from your mother, it gives us a really accurate way of tracing relationships. And the fact that it's relatively short was a great aid to people early in the days of DNA sequencing who needed short segments of DNA that they could practically handle in their laboratories. Today, we sequence entire genomes at much less expense than we used to spend sequencing a mitochondrial genome. But in the early days of understanding human genetic variation, that wasn't true. People were forced to use mitochondrial DNA because of its unique properties. Well, as they began to sequence mitochondrial DNA from different human populations, they noticed that human mitochondrial DNA is very limited in its variation compared to most other related primates. Humans have less mitochondrial DNA variation than chimpanzees, less than bonobos, less than gorillas. We have a very limited amount of variation. That was really interesting because what it meant was if we look at the relationships of people that are sampled around the world today for their mitochondrial DNA, those people share recent common ancestors with each other. And if we draw a tree of relationships between them, we can reconstruct the common ancestor. Because there's relatively little genetic variation in the mitochondrial DNA, we can model the process by which this variation accumulated. Mutations happened during the evolution of modern human mitochondrial DNA variation. And those mutations give us a way to estimate the time that this common ancestor lived. The common ancestor of living people's mitochondrial DNA, as far as we know, after looking at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, the common ancestor lived approximately 200,000 years ago. When they discovered that date in the middle 1980s, Alan Wilson's research group at Berkeley, people involved included Rebecca Kahn, Linda Vigilant, Mark Stoneking, that group noticed that there's something odd about humans. We look like we've come from a very small ancient population because the mitochondrial DNA shows that we're very inbred relative to other primates. That inbreeding, in their view, was a sign that the ancient population that gave rise to humans was very small. And further, because they had sampled people from different continental origins, they noticed that the ancestry of Africans was a bit more diverse than the ancestry of people that lived outside of Africa, and it encompassed the variation of people outside of Africa. That provided a very strong clue that the ancient mitochondrial ancestor of all people living in the world today was an African person that lived approximately 200,000 years ago. This gave rise to the idea that modern humans everywhere in the world had come from a small population that lived in Africa within the last 200,000 years. That was the original out of Africa hypothesis. Well, how do we think about this hypothesis today? We know today that things are somewhat more complicated because the mitochondrial DNA is only one of our genes and in fact we have tens of thousands of different segments of DNA that can potentially inform us about our ancestral population. In some respects they all tell us a similar thing. Although when we look at the mitochondrial DNA the common ancestor was around 200,000 years ago when we look at other genes, we see a much broader range of times of the common ancestor of living people. For some genes, the time is less than 200,000 years. For other genes, it's much, much older. 500,000 years, 800,000 years, 1.8 million years in some cases, 
even older in other cases. That is, today we have variation from populations that lived during the entire course of the Pleistocene and somewhat earlier. That's to be expected when we have our present day variation coming from an inbred population in the past. But that inbreeding was not at a single time in Africa 200,000 years ago. That inbreeding was high during the most of the course of the Pleistocene. We're able to trace our genetic variation back to a substantially more inbred population that persisted for hundreds of thousands of years. That's a clue that when we look at modern human origins, we're not looking at a single event giving rise to modern human genetic variation. We're looking at a process that unfolded over the course of much of the last million or two million years of our evolution. That's very interesting. But another thing that we've begun to learn from looking at other genes is that when we compare people's genetics to each other, some parts of the genome seem to represent a structure that, that existed in past human populations. That is to say that when our population was highly inbred in the past, it wasn't inbred in a single small group that mated randomly. There were different groups, some of which disproportionately gave rise to today's genetic variation, and others of which contributed only a minority of today's genetic variation. When we look in the variable populations of Africa today, we look at people of southern Africa as diverse as Southern Africa Bantu origin people like the Zulus, Southern Africa Kungsan origin people like the Bushmen of the Kalahari, when we look at these diverse people, we see that their genetics today are more diverse than any equivalent groups of people anywhere else in the world. But when we look within those groups of people, we see evidence that those groups share common ancestry that goes further back in time than 200,000 years. That there were once groups of people that were separated from each other with restricted gene flow between them, but separated for hundreds of thousands of years. Groups of people within Africa that were as diverse or more diverse than the Neanderthals were from these early Africans. So we have evidence in today's African genomes of a complex African population, a complex population that existed during the middle Pleistocene period and that gave rise to today's African variation. Where do people outside of Africa fit into this scenario? Well, outside of Africa, we have restricted genetic variation compared to what's present today inside of Africa. Africans are just more variable than people in other places. But most of that variation outside of Africa today stems from variation that once existed inside of Africa within the last 100,000 to 200,000 years. We are in a very real sense today genealogically Africans no matter where in the world we live. To that extent the scenario described by mitochondrial DNA seems very consistent. We've come from an African origin, but that African origin was very complex. It involved populations that were already very different from each other, and some of which disproportionately grew and gave rise to today's variation, others of which gave rise only to a minority of variation that remained inside of Africa. But outside of Africa, we have another factor. There are archaic human populations that existed outside Africa that have contributed a small component to today's genetic variation outside of Africa and in parts of North Africa and East Africa. The Neanderthals were one of those groups of people. Ancient DNA evidence has made clear that the Neanderthal genome has similarities with the genomes of people that live outside Africa now that can't be accounted for by this African population diversification and can't be accounted for by natural selection on a few genes that might have been advantageous and similar because modern non-Africans and Neanderthals are living in the same environment. What the genetic similarities are telling us is that Neanderthals contributed a small percentage, around 2 to 4 percent, 
of the genetic heritage of people that live outside Africa now. And that's true of Europeans, of East Asians, of Australians, of Native Americans, of people everywhere in the world outside of Africa. And again, many Africans. So the genetic ancestry of people living throughout the world today is complex. There are multiple genetic ancestors of people living in different archaic human populations. Some of those archaic human populations were African populations that were already very different from each other during the Middle Pleistocene. And some of those archaic populations were non-African populations, like the Neanderthals. Another population that's very important to this story is the population of Denisovans. And I'll be telling the Denisovan story in another one of these lectures. So where do we stand today? The evolution of modern human genetic variation is, in a very real sense, multi-regional. We have ancestors that lived in different parts of the world during the Middle Pleistocene. What we look at today, in terms of human genetic variation, is a very small subset of the variation that once existed in human populations throughout the world. Those populations interacted with each other some of them expanded disproportionately, making up 90-95% of the genomes of most people in the world now, and others of those populations intermixed with those expanding populations and give rise today to a small fraction of our DNA. This is a complicated origin in which Africa was dominant. It accounts for most of our ancestry, but was nevertheless complex. It already had variability that today has, in large part, been lost. So humans today are parts of a group that has, in a very real sense, coalesced, becoming more limited in genetic variability, people in the world becoming more alike, and people today tracing their ancestry back to populations that lived throughout the course of the Pleistocene. It's a much more interesting picture now than the simple picture of mitochondrial DNA and the expansion of one group and replacing everyone else. But it is a hypothesis that today makes it very complicated to address the origins of different people in the world. What we'll see is that some of that complexity can be handled by looking at ancient DNA evidence that directly represents these ancient populations.